Although Jews were expelled from many parts of Western Europe during the late Middle Ages, many returned during the early modern era. By 1582, a general synod of German Jewry was convened, for now there were Jewish communities in various German towns and cities. At around the same time, Jews settled in other places from which they had once been expelled, in France, the Netherlands, and in Tuscany, for example. In Venice, the number of Jews in the ghetto rose from 900 in 1552 to about 1700 by 1586. While the Jews of Western Europe were growing in numbers, they were also subjected to fewer restrictions. The trends were not all in one direction everywhere, however. Spain did not relent in its intolerance, and as late as 1670-71, to 71, Jews were expelled from Vienna and Lower Austria. There were also expulsions from parts of Italy in the mid-16th century, even as other Italian regions welcomed those expelled. Nevertheless, the broad pattern over the ensuing centuries was a growing Jewish presence in Western Europe, not only demographically, but also economically and intellectually. The Germanic lands, including Austria as well as the German states and principalities, became the central focus of Western European Jewry. It was here that the Jews became most acculturated and most prosperous and it was to Germanic Europe that the Jews of the Slavic lands fled for refuge from successive waves of persecution. By the time of the First World War, there were approximately 617,000 Jews in Germany and 2.2 million in Austria, far more than the 100,000 in France or the 250,000 in Britain, and exceeded in Europe only by the 6 million Jews in the Russian Empire. German Jewry was at the same time the leaders of European Jewry and intensely patriotic, often calling themselves Germans of the Mosaic faith. Even within the ethnically and culturally diverse Habsburg Empire, most Jews spoke German, not only in Austria, but also in regions where they lived among populations that were predominantly Czech or Romanian. Substantial numbers, especially among the educated, also spoke German in predominantly Polish Galicia or in the Hungarian portion of the Austro-Hungarian Empire as the Habsburg realm became known. What was involved was not simply a language preference, but a conscious choice or commitment to become part of the cultural advance of Western European society as a whole, to escape from the narrower traditions of Orthodox Jewry, and to reject the cultures of Eastern European Gentiles in favor of the more advanced German culture. Language was more than symbolic, however. The language chosen determined the whole philosophic, scientific, and other literature to which one had access. The choice was fundamentally cultural, to cast one's lot with Western European civilization, and that underlying choice often involved the German language, because so many Western European Jews lived in Germanic lands. Those who lived in England made the same choice in the form of speaking the English language and adopting an English way of life. France has not had a particularly large Jewish population, but it has played a significant role, both positive and negative, in Jewish history. The first granting of civil equality to Jews in many parts of Europe occurred in the wake of the Napoleonic conquests, which spread the egalitarian principles of the French Revolution. Even after the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815 and the subsequent restoration of old monarchies and their old policies, the concept of civil equality for Jews would not go away, and in fact triumphed over much of Europe during the next two generations. However, France also exemplified the strong undercurrent of anti-Semitism, even in Western European nations that have not had the history of pogroms found in Eastern Europe. The Dreyfus case, involving the false conviction and imprisonment of a Jewish captain in the French army, became a major scandal when it was exposed. More important, the anti-Semitism aroused by the initial conviction and the exaltation in Dreyfus's disgrace revealed an ugly undercurrent of French society. Still more grim in its consequences was the turning over of French Jews to the Nazis by the collaborationist Vichy government during World War II. The zeal with which the French ferreted out Jews for the Nazi concentration camps was a painful contrast to efforts to aid or conceal Jews in other Western European countries such as Holland, Denmark, Norway, and even Hitler's wartime ally, Italy. England, with a larger Jewish population than France, played a less dramatic role in the history of world Jewry. 
at least until World War I. Many Jews prospered in England, and some rose to great prominence, not only converts like Ricardo in economics and Disraeli as a novelist and later a political leader, but also Baron Lionel Nathan de Rothschild, international financier and the first practicing Jew to sit in Parliament in 1858. But Britain's historic contribution to world Jewry came in 1915, when their conquest of Palestine during military operations against the Ottoman Empire was followed by the Balfour Declaration, declaring the right of Jews to settle in Palestine. The influx of Jewish settlers changed the region, made the desert bloom, in Churchill's words, and set the stage for the eventual recreation of the State of Israel. As the modernizing trends of Western Europe opened up new opportunities for Jews, those who wished to remain within the older Jewish tradition, culturally as well as religiously, to dress and talk and behave in the old way, struggled for control of Jewish communities with the modernizers, with varying degrees of success, from Holland to the Habsburg Empire. And this cultural battle continued across the oceans in the United States and Australia. However, this cultural struggle was far less urgent in countries where it was not also a political struggle for control of autonomous Jewish communities. As the medieval political and legal institutions of separate Jewish communities dissolved over time with the emergence of modern states, cultural differences among Jews could be resolved by differing individual and social choices rather than by a struggle for political supremacy and imposed conformity. Depoliticization of internal Jewish cultural differences permitted separate Jewish communities to develop, socially as well as religiously, these communities being identified in many countries, including the United States, as German Jews versus Eastern European Jews. But in broader historical terms, these differences represented in part earlier community and individual choices, as well as accidents of geography, history, and biological descent. In Australia, the acculturated, westernized Jews were both English and German, and they stood in contrast to the Eastern European Jews who formed communities in the older tradition. The former tended to settle in Sydney, the latter in Melbourne. In New York, the distinction was between the more acculturated uptown Jews, initially German, and the downtown Jews, who retained the old ways from Eastern Europe. Similar neighborhood divisions existed in Chicago. The Habsburg Empire extended into both Eastern and Western Europe, not only geographically but culturally as well, and so did the Habsburg Jews. Vienna's wealthy Jews with titles of nobility, Baron Salman de Rothschild being the most prominent example, epitomized the thoroughly westernized ideal, while the despair of ever finding a real home in Europe was symbolized by the doctrine of Zionism, formulated in late 19th century Vienna by Hungarian-born Theodor Herzl. Zionism was widely rejected by the leaders of Western European Jewry, but it struck a responsive chord in Eastern European Jews, who became its principal supporters. Yet, in Vienna itself, the very word Zionism could not be mentioned in the Jewish-owned newspaper for which Herzl wrote. Vienna had a unique history in which Jews in general long remained banned from the city, while specified individual exceptions tolerated Jews lived there and became prominent in the national economy and influential with government. Some were ennobled by the emperor. These wealthy and socially prominent Jews were thoroughly westernized, with a Germanic culture, a cosmopolitan outlook, and were devoted to the emperor Franz Joseph and the House of Habsburg, from whom their privileges and protection flowed. The smallness of this particular group of Jews long resident in Vienna is indicated by the fact that the total Jewish population of the city was less than 2,000 people as late as 1847. But even after large numbers of Jews entered Vienna, legally or illegally, with the passing decades, these special families of historically tolerated Jews remained special. Their whole way of life was far removed from that of the masses of Habsburg Jews, their religion tended to be a modernized Reform Judaism, and a few converted to Christianity. Yet this relatively small, wealthy class of Viennese Jews continued over the years to attract disproportionate attention and resentment from other Austrians, including an impoverished and embittered young man named Adolf Hitler. <laughs>
In between the enormously wealthy Jews of Vienna, with titles of nobility, and the destitute Jews of the eastern hinterlands, were many Jews working in middle-class occupations in a proportion much greater than their proportion of the population. Jews were approximately 1% of the population of Vienna in 1857, 6% in 1869, and 12% within the original boundaries of the city in 1890. Yet Jews were more than one-fifth of all law students and more than one-third of all medical students in Vienna in 1880, as well as approximately one-third of all university students there in 1890. They also owned most of the leading newspapers in Vienna and, for a generation before World War I, dominated Viennese cultural life with prominent figures who included Gustav Mahler and Sigmund Freud. Much the same story could be told of other Habsburg cities, such as Prague, or regions such as Bukowina. Similarly, elsewhere in Germanic Europe, Jews were statistically much overrepresented in the Berlin schools and in the Prussian universities. They dominated journalism in Berlin, where they were less than 6% of the population in 1895. However, Jews moving into the mainstream of German life found their acceptance varying in an uneven pattern from place to place, from time to time, from class to class, and from activity to activity. As early as 1790, Jews were admitted to German universities on an equal footing with other students. But there were still difficulties for Jews seeking faculty appointments a hundred years later. However, for the period 1870 to 1933, Jews, by ancestry or religion, were overrepresented among both students and professors at German universities. In the early 19th century, Germany was an agrarian nation, less developed economically than some other nations of Western Europe. German Jews were correspondingly less economically advanced than the Sephardic Jews in Holland, for example. But the sharp economic rise of Germany in the 19th century was also a rise of German Jewry, who shared the pride of other Germans in their country's emergence as a leading nation in Europe and the world. The political unification of Germany in 1871 was a milestone in this progress. German Jews were noted for their patriotism and their pride in German achievements and culture, both in Germany and abroad. In the early 19th century, as German Jews sought to regain the civil equality they had enjoyed under French occupation during the Napoleonic Wars, their foreignness in dress, customs, and outlook were among the barriers to their social acceptance and legal equality. Some of the wealthier and more acculturated Jews simply converted to Christianity and left their former Jewish life behind them. Karl Marx's father was one of these. Others promoted deliberate efforts to reduce jarring external differences between Jews and Gentiles while retaining the essentials of Judaism and a Jewish community. Reform Judaism grew out of these efforts. Synagogue services began to be conducted in the German language and included mixed choirs, organ music, and other characteristics of Christian churches. For many, the word temple replaced synagogue, and traditional restrictions on food and individual conduct were relaxed. Such changes were anathema to Orthodox Jews and made little headway in Eastern Europe but Reform Judaism quickly spread as far as the United States in the early 19th century, varying in its degree of deviation from Orthodox Judaism from country to country. The relative proportions of the two branches of Judaism, and of conservative Judaism which developed somewhere between them, also varied from country to country. Reform Judaism symbolized a wider assimilationist tendency among German Jews, just as German Jews epitomized assimilationism among European Jewry as a whole. While many Vienna Jews were also thoroughly acculturated, that was not true of the much larger number of Eastern European Jews in the Habsburg Empire. By the end of the 19th century, there were nearly 600,000 Jews in Germany, generally prosperous, German-speaking, with more than half of them in commerce, one-fifth in industry and trade, and about 6% in the professions and government. Even the most religiously orthodox Jews considered themselves thoroughly German. This remained true even after immigration to other countries. 19th century German Jewish immigrants in the United States, Chile and Czechoslovakia often took part in the general cultural life of the German enclaves in these countries, while retaining their own religious institutions. <laughs>
In calling themselves Germans of the Mosaic faith, German Jews used a terminology which had relevance to their social reality, but no such corresponding term took hold among Eastern European Jews, in circumstances where to be a Jew was to be wholly outside the social world of the Gentiles. In the first decade of the 20th century, one-fourth of all law students and medical students in Germany were Jews, though Jews were only one percent of the population. One-third of the graduate students in philosophy were also Jews. In some German cities, Jews were a majority of all doctors. Jews were only five percent of the Berlin population in 1905, but they paid 31 percent of all income tax collected in that city averaging more than twice the income tax per person of either Protestants or Catholics. In various other cities, Jews paid from three times to nine times the taxes of other citizens. For Germany as a whole, Jewish income was more than three times the national average. The integration of the Jews into German life was social as well as economic. Nearly half of all Jews who married in Germany during the 1920s married Gentiles. Thousands converted to Christianity or simply abandoned Judaism or drifted away from the Jewish community. The tragic irony was that German Jews were among the most assimilated and accepted Jews in the world in the decade before the Nazis came to power. Despite the extremely small and declining Jewish population of Germany, Jews were highly visible and vulnerable to resentment for a number of reasons. They were concentrated in urban areas and in a relatively few occupations, which they often dominated. By the early 1930s, just before Hitler came to power, one half of all the theater directors in Germany were Jews, and three quarters of all the plays produced were written by Jews. Jews owned 4,000 wholesale textile businesses, 40% of all such businesses in Germany, as well as 60% of all wholesale and retail clothing businesses. Jewish politicians were long prominent on the political left, usually much further left than the Jewish voters, and Jews predominated in a short-lived communist government established in Germany after the country's defeat in World War I. The unpopularity of that regime gave a boost to anti-Semitism in Germany and was used for years afterwards in anti-Semitic propaganda by the Nazis and others. Other historical developments added to the unpopularity of Jews. Jews prominent on the political left were highly critical of Germany's participation in World War I, and some in the Reichstag voted against military appropriations. This, too, left bitter memories among other Germans, especially after the catastrophic defeat, international humiliation, and dire economic distress suffered by Germany in the wake of the war. It was politically easy to depict the Jews as unpatriotic, subversive elements who had stabbed Germany in the back and tried to impose communism. No one made these arguments more vehemently than the Nazis. Events in Eastern Europe added to the problems of Jews in Germany. Jewish refugees from the East, with far less education, money, or assimilation than German Jews, flooded into Germany after World War I. By 1933, one-fifth of all Jews in Germany were foreign. Many were an embarrassment to the German Jews, some of whom advocated immigration restriction. Eastern European Jews were referred to generically as Polacks by Jews and non-Jews alike. Anti-Semitic appeals had long been a feature of German political life, but the parties that relied primarily on anti-Semitism tended to do poorly at the polls. The Nazis did not rely solely or even primarily on anti-Semitism, and in fact tried to be all things to all people. Before coming to power, they even had a Jewish following. Moreover, the Nazi party was never a serious political contender during the decade of the 1920s, however much sensation they created with their rabble-rousing and violence. Most Germans during that period regarded them as a joke. In the election of 1928, the Nazis polled less than a million votes out of 31 million votes cast. The desperate years of the Great Depression, under an ineffective German government headed by the now senile military hero Paul von Hindenburg, gave Hitler his chance. From less than 3% of the vote in 1928, the Nazis shot up to 18% in 1930 and to 37% in 1932, the highest level of support they ever achieved in a free election. 
it was also the largest support of any of the numerous German political parties. In January 1933, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany and 15 months later was voted dictatorial powers. Anti-Semitic policies began immediately and increased at a measured pace. Laws barred Jews from many professions and made their lives miserable with innumerable legal restrictions supplemented by ad hoc harassment and violence by Nazi thugs. But Hitler shrewdly avoided outpacing what German public opinion would support. When a boycott of Jewish businesses in 1933 failed to get the expected support, the Nazis called it off after four days. But by 1935, after much anti-Semitic propaganda, Hitler instituted the Nuremberg Laws, which stripped Jews of the rights of German citizens and initiated new prohibitions and restrictions. His first serious miscalculation came when he launched the notorious Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass, in November 1938, in response to an assassination of a German official by a Jewish youth. Publicly billed as a spontaneous outburst of rage by the German people against the Jews, it was a night of violence and vandalism against Jewish homes and property, orchestrated and carried out by the Nazis. A preliminary report listed more than a hundred homes set on fire, more than a hundred synagogues burned, hundreds of shops destroyed, and dozens of murders of Jews. Later estimates were much larger. The shops looted ran into the thousands rather than the hundreds, and the full extent of the disaster may never be known. But, as the Nazi leaders themselves quickly discovered, they had miscalculated German public reaction, which was a revulsion even among many Nazi party members. Thereafter, the remainder of the Nazi actions against the Jews were taken with extraordinary secrecy and in calculated stages. Jews themselves did not realize the full extent of what was happening until it was too late. Germans heard only rumors amid the numerous rumors that circulate during wartime. Concentration camps had existed for years in Nazi Germany and contained both Jews and non-Jews. But when many of these became mass extermination camps during World War II, those who knew firsthand about the mass murders were under threat of death if they told anyone. While Nazi propaganda depicted anti-Semitic outbursts as the righteous wrath of the whole German people against the Jews, Internal Nazi documents throughout the Hitler era complained bitterly of inadequate public support and cooperation with anti-Jewish policies, despite years of brainwashing. A few brave souls even actively opposed or sabotaged these policies, though that risked brutal punishment for both the individual and his family. Against this grim background, it is all the more remarkable that some Jews were hidden by other Germans. Estimates for Berlin alone run into the thousands. Most Germans, like most other people, were not heroes. But the difference in attitudes between the German populace and the Nazi government was indicated by the fact that Jews, lacking legal protection in Nazi Germany even before the war, suffered no such pogroms as they suffered from the general populations of Eastern Europe or parts of the Islamic world under such circumstances. The official persecutions that preceded the Holocaust were enough to drive most Jews from Germany. Between 1933 and 1938, approximately 150,000 of the half-million Jews in Germany emigrated. An equal number fled in the year before World War II began, in 1939. This mass exodus saved a majority of the German Jews from the fate that overtook other Jews in the conquered lands of Europe. Of the millions of Jews killed by the Nazis, less than 200,000 were German. Nevertheless, the slaughter of those who remained represented the destruction of one-third the German Jews of the pre-Nazi period, just as the Holocaust represented the killing of one-third of all the Jews in the world. As if such staggering massacres of defenseless men, women, and children were not enough, the Nazis imposed a pervasive dehumanization that sadistically scarred the souls before the mass murders and the burning of bodies. If one historical episode can be singled out as the nadir of human civilization, indeed, as a bitter mockery of that term, it must surely be the Holocaust. Post-war Germany had fewer than 25,000 Jews remaining, less than 5% of the German Jewish population just a decade earlier. Moreover, 
many Jews around the world were bitterly opposed to any Jews at all remaining in Germany after the Holocaust. While several thousand emigrated from Germany to either Israel or the United States, most stayed. Communist East Germany, the Democratic Republic of Germany, was at first a country where individual Jews rose to prominence after the war. But Stalin's anti-Semitic policies in the early 1950s were echoed in so-called anti-Zionist purges in East Germany. From 1952 to 1961, approximately 5,000 East German Jews fled to West Germany as part of a general influx of 20,000 Jews to the Federal Republic of Germany. The State of Israel made claims for reparations against both German governments on behalf of victims of Nazism, many of whom were settled in Israel at great expense to the Israeli government. East Germany rejected these claims, but West Germany paid more than $10 billion directly to individuals over a period of two decades. In addition, vast amounts of equipment and supplies were given as reparations to the new nation of Israel, which desperately needed them. Some individuals among the post-war German youth came to work in Israel as a symbolic gesture. Perhaps what it symbolized went beyond Germans and Jews, the flickering light of common humanity persisting against the dark background of enormous evils. The Holocaust's lasting impact can be seen in many ways, including demographically. On the eve of the Second World War, the Jewish population of the world was nearly 17 million people. But by the end of the war, this population was reduced to 11 million, and half a century later, it still had not recovered its pre-war level, but was less than 13 million. Moreover, the primacy of European Jewry was gone. In 1939, more than half the Jews of the world lived in Europe, but by 1991, Europe contained less than a sixth of the world's Jewish population. Most now lived in the Western Hemisphere. The Western Hemisphere By the 20th century, Jews in the Western Hemisphere meant primarily Jews in the United States. However, the first Jewish settlements in the New World were in Latin America. The earliest community of Jews in the 13 North American colonies came from Brazil in 1654. Jewish communities in Latin America are very old, even if not very large. Moreover, Jews have contributed disproportionately to the commercial and industrial development of a number of Latin American nations. Persecutions in 15th and 16th century Spain and Portugal sent many Jews fleeing, not only to countries with greater tolerance, but also to Western Hemisphere colonies, where intolerance would be harder to enforce, including Spanish and Portuguese colonies. Jews also settled in Dutch colonies, which exhibited the religious tolerance characteristic of Holland. In mid-17th century Dutch Brazil, an estimated one-half of the small white population were Jews. In Curaçao, another Dutch colony, Jews constituted an estimated 36% of the whole population. As in Holland itself, these were Sephardic Jews. In addition to those who were openly and explicitly Jewish in a religious sense, many descendants of Jews forcibly converted to Christianity in Spain and Portugal in previous centuries also settled in Latin America, some resuming the Jewish faith overtly or covertly, and others remaining Catholic, with some of these latter intermarrying with the Spanish and Portuguese. These converted Jews, however, exhibited much the same economic patterns as their kinsmen who followed the traditional faith. They also fell under various political bans against Jews occupying high positions, or even settling in some colonies. Some were pursued by the Inquisition on charges of having secretly remained Jews after their conversions to Christianity, and at least one was burned at the stake as a result of such charges. The skills possessed by the Jews and converted Jews were often in short supply in the Latin American colonies. The two largest occupational categories of converted Jews called before the Inquisition in Peru were merchants and commercial travelers. Nearly one-third of the Portuguese conversos investigated by the Inquisition in Bahia province in Brazil worked in the professions, including lawyers and judges. Only about 12% of the converted Jews in Bahia were working class, and these included shoemakers, musicians, and other skilled people. More than a third were either stationary or itinerant merchants. As early as the 17th century, 
Jews owned dozens of sugar mills on Brazil's northern coast, perhaps half of all the sugar mills there. Despite a bitter early history of persecution by the Inquisition in the colonial era, Jews later found both religious tolerance and economic opportunities in many of the nations of Latin America, some of which were actively seeking to attract immigrants from Europe in the wake of achieving independence. In the 19th century, Jewish immigrants to Latin America brought industrial, scientific, and entrepreneurial skills, all in short supply in the recipient nations. Retailing was a major occupation of Jews economically active in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Peru, and Curaçao. Jews were also prominent in industrial enterprises in Argentina, Mexico, Peru, and Guatemala. In Rio de Janeiro, Jews were the dominant element in the gem trade, an occupation they also followed in Peru. Altogether, there were only a few thousand Jews in all of Latin America as late as 1889, despite their prominence in particular industries and high-level occupations. However, even these few Jews were not a socially cohesive group, but were fragmented along lines of national origin and according to their respective degrees of assimilation into the various cultures of the region. The French Jews of Brazil and Mexico assimilated almost completely, as did the Sephardic Jews of Santo Domingo and Colombia, but the Sephardics of Curaçao remained a separate enclave from the time of their arrival in the mid-17th century, marrying among themselves so much that some families were linked to each other several times over. This pattern persisted in Curaçao until the generation born in the early decades of the 20th century reached marriageable age in the 1930s and 1940s. Among 18th and 19th century Sephardim in Brazil, marrying one's cousins was as common as it was in New York. Over the centuries, however, so many Jews in Latin America had disappeared by biological absorption into the larger society that many Hispanics in the late 20th century claimed Jewish ancestry, partly because of the prestige of the early Jews, but also because it marked them as Caucasian in societies where admixtures of Indians and Africans were common. Even among Jews who remained Jews, the social separation of Sephardim and Ashkenazim was carried over from Europe. The Sephardim of Curaçao remained aloof from the later arriving Ashkenazim, who ultimately grew to be a larger community. Even after intermarriage became common among these Sephardim during World War II, the Sephardic women of Curaçao usually married Dutch men, and the Sephardic men usually married Latin women. Moreover, Arabic-speaking Sephardim, so-called Oriental Jews, were another separate community in Latin America. However much the larger societies might lump them all together as Jews, the various internal divisions were sufficiently important to the Jews themselves for them to maintain separate existences, separate synagogues, and separate burial grounds, a pattern still continued in late 20th century Latin America. Jews from the Middle East and North Africa enjoyed none of the prestige of Sephardim in Holland, for example, and sometimes compromised the prestige of the Sephardic community as a whole in Argentina, though Argentine Sephardim tended on average to be quite comparable to Argentine Ashkenazim in economic level. Moreover, even within the Sephardic community of Buenos Aires, Jews from Morocco tended to concentrate in different neighborhoods from Jews from Turkey or Syria, and all tended to maintain separate organizations. Both in Latin America and in the United States, those Jews who established themselves in colonial times or who immigrated prior to the 1880s were very different from, and were subsequently overwhelmed numerically by, Jewish immigrants from the era of the massive exodus from Eastern Europe that began in the last two decades of the 19th century. Both in the United States and in Latin America, many of these Jewish immigrants brought with them from Eastern Europe the skills of the garment industry, whose expansion after their arrival changed the clothing patterns of the poor and the working classes in both regions of the hemisphere. Mass-produced, ready-made clothes were the exception rather than the rule prior to the expansion of the garment industry in the late 19th century. Two key ingredients were the perfection of the sewing machine and the arrival of large numbers of Jewish immigrants. The well-to-do were able to buy clothes made to order by tailors or seamstresses, 
but the poor and the working classes generally relied on either homemade clothes or second-hand clothes cast off by the more affluent classes. Both in Europe and in the Western Hemisphere, the buying, renovating, and selling of second-hand clothing was a major economic activity in the 19th century. As late as 1880, less than half the men's clothing in the United States was purchased ready to wear. It was much the same story in Latin America. Sewing machines and fabric-cutting machines provided the technological basis for the change to mass-produced clothing, but the massive influx of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe provided much of the labor, skills, and entrepreneurship. In both regions of the hemisphere, piecework at meager wages for the workers and uncertain profits by the sweatshop operator were the basis of clothing priced low enough to be affordable by the masses. By the time of the First World War, even in Latin America, the ready-made suit had replaced second-hand, homemade, or tailor-made clothing for most people. Throughout Latin America, the Jews work habits, their willingness to work relentlessly for long hours at almost any job, contrasted sharply with the more relaxed lifestyle of the surrounding population. Many of the Jews who arrived in the Latin American republics around the beginning of the 20th century began their careers in the New World as peddlers. Much retailing was the work of peddlers carrying their wares on their backs, sometimes for lack of ordinary employment, and in sometimes and places such peddling was not clearly distinct from begging. Despite such tenuous beginnings, the contributions of Jews to the economic development of the Western Hemisphere remained impressive in the 20th century as in earlier times. They created much of the clothing and textile industry of the United States, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina, founded Avianca Airlines in Colombia, produced some of Mexico's most prominent engineers and doctors, and established hundreds of factories in Venezuela. While Jewish community organizations have flourished in Latin America as social organizations, the specifically religious aspect of these organizations has tended to be less than crucial. Estimates of Jewish intermarriages in Brazil range from 25 to 30 percent. Although there have been sporadic outbursts of antisemitism here and there in parts of Latin America, the independent nations of the region have by no means maintained the traditions of persecution from the days of the Spanish Inquisition. Jews have not only flourished economically, but have also become socially acceptable enough to reach such prominent positions as Vice President of Panama, Commander of Chile's Air Force, and Generals in the Brazilian Army. Nevertheless, when shiploads of Jewish refugees from Nazi persecution in Europe tried to escape to the Western Hemisphere on the eve of World War II, many were turned away. The most famous of these ships carrying Jewish refugees was the liner St. Louis, which in 1939 was turned away from Cuba and the United States and was forced to return to Europe, where Holland, England, and France accepted portions of the refugees. However, other ships carrying Jewish refugees were turned away from Uruguay and Paraguay, and those briefly landed at Costa Rica were subsequently expelled. Partly this reflected a reluctance of some countries to accept more immigrants in general, but various Latin American countries accepted other immigrants and refugees while turning away Jews. Argentina Colonial Argentina in the 16th and 17th centuries was subject to the Spanish Inquisition, which claimed the lives of many Jews and converted Jews. Throughout the colonial era, Jews lived under a precarious tolerance. Even after Argentine independence, it was 1860 before the first Jewish wedding was performed in Buenos Aires, after much legal and political maneuvering. But in the late 19th century, Argentina began to encourage immigration from Europe, including the immigration of Jews, and that meant allowing greater religious toleration. By this time, however, the few Jews from the colonial era had long since been absorbed into the general population. As of 1888, the Jewish population of the entire country was estimated as only 1,500 people. A year later, a ship docked in the port of Buenos Aires carrying more than 800 Jews, the beginning of the modern era of Jewish immigration to Argentina. Today's Jewish communities in Argentina date from the mass immigration era, the quarter of a century between 1889 and World War I. Although there were fewer than 2,000 Jews in the country when this era began, there were an estimated 10,000 by 1895, 
then 100,000 by World War I, and more than 200,000 by the end of the decade of the 1920s. Unlike the earlier settlements of Sephardim, these later communities were of Ashkenazic Jews, primarily from Eastern Europe. Just one decade after the first Russian immigrants arrived, more than 90% of all Jews in Argentina were from Eastern Europe. As late as 1936, half the Jewish population of Buenos Aires was born in Eastern Europe, and they constituted more than four-fifths of the foreign-born Jewish population, which still outnumbered the native-born Jews by more than two to one. At first, during the early years of immigration, many immigrants settled in the numerous agricultural colonies established for Jews in the Western Hemisphere by Baron Maurice de Hirsch, a very wealthy Bavarian Jew who saw an agricultural life as the solution of the Jews' ages-old problems in the cities. Baron de Hirsch donated $40 million so that each Jewish family could begin life in these agricultural colonies with a house fenced land of from 185 to 370 acres, credit for the first year's expenses, seed, farm implements, draft animals, and livestock. The farms were subsequently sold to them in installments over the years at below market value. As of 1909, more than 19,000 Jews lived in these agricultural colonies in Argentina, compared to fewer than 17,000 Jews in Buenos Aires and 13,000 in the rest of the country. Baron de Hirsch's agricultural colonies were scattered across Argentina and also to a lesser extent in Brazil, the United States, and Canada. Neither the Baron nor the Jews who settled in these colonies knew much about agriculture. He often bought the wrong kind of land, and the early settlers made very elementary mistakes in farming, an occupation most of them had never known before. Primitive Argentine farmers in the vicinity often had to teach the first Jewish settlers how to farm. Over the early decades, into the 1920s, the population of the agricultural colonies grew, but this numerical growth concealed a large turnover, as many left for city life that was more familiar and were replaced by a growing number of new Jewish immigrants to Argentina. In one sense, these colonies succeeded, and in another they failed. Eventually, the settlers became better farmers, and in fact introduced new crops and new techniques, leading to greater prosperity for themselves and new food for Argentine domestic consumption and export. But in terms of their original purpose, an agricultural way of life for Jews, they failed. Settlers sold their land, often at a profit during the wheat boom around World War I, and moved into the cities many carrying bitter memories of clashes with the heavy-handed administrators in charge of these colonies. By the late 20th century, the colonies were in disrepair, and less than a thousand Jewish families remained there. Other Jewish agricultural colonies failed throughout the Western Hemisphere, monuments to the difficulty of deliberately changing a people from above. The Jews who left the colonies, essentially the young, entered professions in which Jews had been prominent for centuries. Some of the Argentine Jewish families spoke of sowing wheat and reaping doctors. Some farmers sold out and used the money to open businesses in Buenos Aires. By the mid-1930s, only 11% of the Jewish people of Argentina still remained in the agricultural colonies, though a new influx of refugees from Nazi Germany temporarily repopulated these colonies over the next few years. Large changes in population size over the generations marked the rise and fall of the agricultural colonies. There were fewer than 7,000 people in these colonies in 1896, but their population grew to a peak of more than 20,000 in 1925 and then declined to about 6,000 in 1961, a decline that has continued as Argentine Jews became an increasingly urban people. As early as World War I, more than half the Jews in Argentina 65,000 out of 110,000 were living in Buenos Aires. During the era of mass immigration, most Jewish immigrants to Latin America arrived in the lowest class accommodations on the ships that brought them, and many of them began life in Argentina destitute. Among those who settled in urban areas, principally Buenos Aires, peddling was the first occupation of many, if not most, as it was among Jews throughout Latin America. In Argentina, their willingness to sell on credit to the local people without collateral gave them an advantage over Argentine retailers who insisted on cash and a large profit margin. During these economically precarious times, 
Some Jewish women were drawn into prostitution rings, often by the deception and trickery of Jewish pimps who operated as far away as Eastern Europe, from which they recruited girls to work in Buenos Aires, then one of the world centers of prostitution. As of 1909, approximately half the brothels in Buenos Aires were run by Jews, and nearly half of the more than 500 registered prostitutes in the city were Jewish. Although these pimps and prostitutes usually encountered little trouble from public officials, who were often paid off, they were targets of vigilante raids by other Jews who were outraged at what was going on and apprehensive as to how this would affect the Argentines' attitudes toward the Jewish community as a whole. Although the early Jewish immigrants began at the bottom of the economy and society, like many other immigrants, they brought with them skills, some obsolescent artisan skills, but still skills of value in the Argentine economy of that era, and experience in retail commerce, even if at the lowly level of the peddler in many cases. In this, they were unlike many Italian or Spanish immigrants, for example, and unlike the native Argentines. For the period from 1895 to 1930, the largest category of workers among the Jews were skilled workers, who were an absolute majority of all Jewish workers throughout that period. After many vicissitudes, these skills paid off as Jews became prominent in the garment industry. They also became shoemakers, jewelers, bakers, watchmakers, and furniture makers. In addition, Jews eventually became prominent in heavy industry, machinery, chemicals, automobiles, electrical equipment, in Argentina, unlike their experience in the United States, where Jews played little role in such sectors of the economy. The prosperity achieved by Jews, though usually modest, was resented by many, and this resentment was exploited by demagogues. As early as 1910, Argentine mobs raged through the Jewish quarter of Buenos Aires, beating and raping. Even worse outbreaks occurred in 1919, including pillage and the murder of hundreds, as police stood passively by. More genteel Argentines attacked the Jews verbally, in the press, in novels, and in drama. Among other things, it was said that the great stores of the Argentines were often empty, while the shops of the Jews were constantly crowded with customers. This was part of a more general Argentine reaction against economically rising immigrants, and particularly those who were small businessmen, such as Jews and Levantines, who were said to fill no real need, but were simply driving many already established shopkeepers to poverty. How they could do this without giving the Argentine customer a better deal was not explained. Some of the strongest criticisms were directed against the Jewish agricultural colonies, which neither competed with Argentines nor had enough contact even to be accused of exploitation. The criticism here was precisely that they kept to themselves and did not assimilate. The economic rise of Jews in Argentina was by no means smooth, however, nor always permanent. The records of a Jewish community organization in Buenos Aires revealed that most of its members who rose from the working class in early 20th century Argentina to become businessmen were workers again by 1945. Nevertheless, over the generations, Argentine Jews generally rose. The once ubiquitous Jewish peddler, the two terms being virtually interchangeable to many Argentines, gradually faded away as Jews found other occupations and created businesses in a variety of industries. In 1909, for example, the first Jewish-owned sawmill was opened, and by 1940, approximately one-third of all the sawmills in Buenos Aires were owned by Jews. As in the United States, Jewish immigrants in Argentina put to use the garment and textile industry skills they brought with them from Eastern Europe, beginning with small sweatshop operations and eventually expanding into larger enterprises and into retail shops offering cloth, fur, and leather goods. As of 1960, nearly half of all Argentine Jews who worked in manufacturing worked in the manufacture of clothing and textiles. At the same time, nearly one-fourth of all Jewish men were proprietors of stores, and more than a third were in commerce of some sort, and another 10% were executives. About 20% were factory workers but even these were often in skilled jobs as tailors, furriers, shoemakers, electricians, and makers of precision instruments. About 8% were in the professions, doctors being the most numerous, followed by architects and engineers. 
there were more than ten times more Jewish artists and writers than there were Jewish cooks and domestic servants. The Jewish proletariat virtually disappeared in Argentina. When compared to the Argentine population as a whole, the economic position of the Jews is particularly striking. While 45% of Jews in manufacturing were in clothing and textiles, only 13% of all Argentines in manufacturing worked in these fields. German Jewish refugees of the 1930s were by the 1950s operating some of the nation's largest clothing factories, and Jews of various national backgrounds were prominent in a variety of other industries. While from 41 to 60 percent of Argentines were classified as lower class in 1961, fewer than 4 percent of Jews were in that category. Although the Jewish population in general achieved socioeconomic levels far higher than those of the Argentine population as a whole, to some extent this reflects the fact that the Jewish males in Argentina have a higher average age, 42, than that of the country as a whole, 36. Still, that can hardly explain all of most of the distinctive achievements of Jews, distinctive as to the economic sectors in which they achieved success, as well as the level of success achieved. Jewish participation in industry, commerce, the professions, and technology has helped make Argentina the most modern, industrialized, and highest income nation in Latin America. But in Argentina, as elsewhere, Jews have tended to avoid politics, and especially ethnic community politics. They have even publicly deplored political appeals to the Jewish community by others. What Jewish political activity there has been in Argentina has tended to be universalistic and of the political left, whether moderate or radical. This, too, has been a common pattern among Jews, from the United States to South Africa. Political power was virtually out of the question for Jews in Argentina where they were just 2% of the population nationally and only 5% even in Buenos Aires, where they were concentrated. The total Jewish population of Argentina in the late 20th century was estimated as perhaps half a million people, though there was considerable uncertainty and controversy about this, with other estimates being lower than a quarter of a million. Anti-Semitism has waxed and waned in Argentina. Ironically, President Juan Perón, pro-fascist and a protector of Nazi war criminals, was less anti-Semitic than the government that preceded him, or perhaps governments that succeeded him. His protectionist policies benefited Jewish manufacturers. A Jewish finance minister under the Peron regime was widely credited with stabilizing the Argentine economy and currency, despite Peron's idiosyncratic administration. His exile, after a new junta seized control, was followed by runaway inflation. In 1980, more than a thousand Jews were known to be arrested and detained in Argentina, Jacobo Timmerman being the best known. How much of this represented anti-Semitism is hard to know, in a country where such repression has extended well beyond Jews. The return of democracy, and of Timmerman, to Argentina, represented a hopeful sign. Still, as the head of B'nai B'rith in Buenos Aires said, democracy very rapidly becomes anarchy in this country. He added, that's our danger. No one had more stake in stability and order in Argentina than its Jewish population. Their prosperity and prominence in intellectual and business pursuits made them obvious targets for demagogues, mobs, or anyone looking for a scapegoat. While Jews were only about 1% of the Argentine population, they were 20% of the university student body. The United States the first Jews to reach colonial America were a small group of Sephardim among the passengers who arrived aboard the Santa Catarina in 1654 from Brazil. After Dutch rule in Brazil was replaced by Portuguese rule, the religious tolerance characteristic of Holland was replaced by the persecutions characteristic of Portugal, causing Jews to flee to many destinations, including the colonies in North America. Two years after the Santa Catarina put the first Sephardim ashore, the first Jewish congregation was established in the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, later to become New York. Twenty-one years later, another congregation was established at Newport, Rhode Island, and before the middle of the 18th century, there were also Sephardic congregations in Savannah, Philadelphia, and Charleston. The first Ashkenazic Jews from Germanic Europe arrived in 1702, but it was decades later before the first Ashkenazic synagogues were established, 
In the meantime, the small numbers of Ashkenazim joined the larger Sephardic congregations and adjusted to Sephardic rituals. At first, the Sephardim looked down upon their German co-religionists, some Sephardic families even disinheriting children who married Ashkenazim. But eventually the German Jews began to establish themselves, some becoming elected leaders in the congregations, and their intermarriages with Sephardim became more frequent. The numbers of both groups remained relatively small. At the time of the American Revolution, the total Jewish population of the American colonies was only about 2,000. In no part of colonial America did Jews enjoy equal legal rights with the Christian population. The first Sephardim to land at New Amsterdam encountered resistance to their settling there by the governor of the colonies, Peter Stuyvesant. However, the colony was controlled by the Dutch West India Company in Holland, which had Sephardim on its board of directors, and Stuyvesant was overruled. In general, however, anti-Jewish hostility in the colonies was never on a scale approaching that of Europe. Jews in America were simply one of a number of immigrant groups, while in Europe they were for centuries the single conspicuous minority. Thinly spread among the general population and acculturated in dress and manner, Jews were accepted members, and sometimes officials, in colonial organizations, public and private. In 1774, the first Jew was elected to public office in America, serving in the Provincial Congress as a representative from South Carolina. He may also have been the first Jew elected to any public office anywhere in the modern world. The few remaining political restrictions on Jews began to break down in the wake of the American Revolution and the universalistic ideals it promoted. Before the middle of the 19th century, the first Jew was elected to the United States Senate from Florida. With the passing years and continuing immigration, German Jews gradually came to predominate among American Jewry, not only numerically, but also by achievement. They often began as peddlers in both settled and frontier areas of America, spread thinly among the general population, but playing an important role in retail distribution. The more successful moved up from their backpack or pushcart to a horse and wagon or to a store, and a very few ultimately established major department stores, with such well-known names as Macy, Gimbel, Abraham and Strauss, Bloomingdale, Altman, and Sachs in New York. Bamberger in New Jersey, Eileen in Boston, and Hecht in Washington, D.C. Perhaps the most dramatic rise was that of a pushcart peddler named Levi Strauss in California's gold rush days. The tough trousers he produced for miners eventually made him a millionaire and made Levi's a world-famous trade name. Another German Jew, Julius Rosenwald, was instrumental in turning Sears into a leading retail chain. Family networks were one source of the success of the early Jews, through which a poor peddler in the hinterlands could receive goods on credit from established relatives in the big city who might not trust a stranger. Peddling was a major economic function in colonial America, and in the early era of the United States, when stores were scarce outside of large cities, and traveling back and forth to town from scattered farm communities was difficult, time-consuming, and sometimes dangerous. The peddler who brought goods to the door was welcome as a source of products and of news from the outside world. His religion was seldom a matter of concern. German Jews tended to become more popular than the Yankee peddlers they replaced. The great mass of the German Jewish immigrants of the 19th century had at least some elementary education before they reached the United States. Like German Jews elsewhere during this period, they were proud of and loyal to the German culture and were often welcomed into the institutional and cultural life of other Germans in America. Within the Jewish community itself, sermons were usually delivered in German, Jews spoke among themselves in German, and established German-language newspapers. With the passing generations, however, the German Jews became as Americanized as they had once been Germanized. The 1860s and 1870s were years of struggle between the German and English languages within the Jewish community to some extent between generations, and thus a struggle that necessarily ended with the victory of the later generations. The era of German predominance among American Jewry lasted until the 1880s, when the massive immigration of Jews from Eastern Europe swamped the existing Jewish community in the United States. However, German Jews continued to leave their mark on many aspects of American life, 
in such well-known companies as Hart, Schaffner & Marks, Bosch & Company, Florsheim, Kuhn, Loeb & Company, Goldman Sachs, Simon & Schuster, and many others. In music, Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein. In publishing, Joseph Pulitzer and Adolf Oakes, New York Times. In science, A. A. Michelson and Albert Einstein were just some of the German Jews who made enduring contributions to American life. Beginning in the early 1880s and continuing on a mass scale until the beginning of the First World War in 1914, more than two million Eastern European Jews immigrated to the United States. More than four-fifths came from Tsarist Russia, and so included Polish and Lithuanian Jews, as well as Jews who had lived in Russia before its absorption of Poland and Lithuania. Altogether, more than one-third of all the Jews in Eastern Europe emigrated, and more than 90% of them came to the United States, most settling in New York City. The Lower East Side of Manhattan became the principal home of the Eastern European Jews and the most densely populated section of the city. It long remained common for people in this neighborhood to sleep three or more to a room. In many respects, the Lower East Side was a classic slum, with overcrowded and deteriorating buildings, seldom repaired, and with shared toilets, two to a floor in many tenements, and outdoor backyard toilets in others. The sewage and backyard toilets either collected there until the sanitation department periodically carted it away, or else ran off in open channels, creating foul stenches either way. Very similar conditions existed in Chicago. The people who lived in Manhattan's Lower East Side slums were generally not used to city life, having come from the villages and towns of agricultural Eastern Europe. They were Yiddish-speaking Jews from a separate, poor, and narrow world, wholly unlike the educated, prosperous, and cosmopolitan German Jews who lived farther uptown. The conspicuously foreign demeanor, dress, and attitudes of the downtown Jews were a painful embarrassment to the uptown Jews, who sought to get them to speak English, practice cleanliness, and avoid loud and demonstrative behavior. Much the same relationship existed in Chicago between German Jews and the Eastern European Jews there. In both cities, the German Jews provided charity and did volunteer work among their Eastern European brethren, but maintained a social distance and often betrayed their distaste. When Eastern European Jews moved into the Halsted Street section of Chicago, the German Jews moved out. Usually, however, both in New York and Chicago, the Eastern European Jews were in no financial condition to live in the middle-class neighborhoods inhabited by German Jews. Some flavor of the lives of the early immigrants was captured by the famous bandleader Benny Goodman, reminiscing about his childhood in an Eastern European Jewish neighborhood in Chicago. I can remember a time when we lived in a basement without heat during the winter, and a couple of times when there wasn't anything to eat. I don't mean much to eat, I mean anything. That isn't an experience you forget in a hurry. I haven't ever forgotten it. While the German Jews and the Eastern European Jews were united by religion, in another sense they were divided by religion. The Orthodox Judaism of Eastern Europe was a more strict doctrine, used a more traditional service, and was a more central part of life than the much-transformed Reform Judaism common among German Jews, who were accused by the Orthodox of aping the Christians by having church-like temples rather than synagogues and observing the Sabbath on Sunday rather than Saturday. Eastern European Jews were by no means all very religious. Many worked on Saturdays or did not adhere strictly to the dietary laws. But the Judaism which played either a large or smaller role in their life was Orthodox Judaism. Intermarriage with Gentiles was much rarer among Eastern European Jews. Indeed, marriage between Eastern European Jews and German Jews was not common. Neither the economic level nor the occupational skills of the Jewish immigrants who arrived in the United States during the mass immigration era were the same as those of the existing American Jewish population. However, the newcomers had more skills than many other immigrant groups of the time. Rarely were these professional skills, but seldom were the Eastern European Jews unskilled laborers. They had a variety of artisan skills, many associated with clothing and related fields, such as shoemaking. Nearly two-thirds of the Jewish immigrants to the United States from 1899 to 1914 were skilled workers, and just over half these skills were in the clothing industry. 
This was not counting leather goods or animal products, though significant numbers of Jews had skills associated with the production and sale of shoes and furs. Indeed, three-quarters of all furriers among the immigrants of this era were Jews. Overall, the skill mix among Eastern European Jews meshed with the industrial concentrations of German Jews. As of 1880, when most American Jews were still of German extraction, half of all Jewish firms were in clothing and allied fields. Moreover, Jewish firms dominated these fields. By the end of the 19th century, German Jews owned 80% of all retail clothing stores in New York City and 90% of the wholesale clothing trade. Decades earlier, Jews already owned the largest wholesale shoe company in the country. The match of Eastern European Jews' skills and the industries dominated by German Jews often made for an economically symbiotic relationship between the two groups. In the clothing industry, centered in New York, it became a common pattern for Eastern European Jews to work as employees of German Jews. Moreover, the vast influx of immigrants contributed to a rapid expansion of the whole industry. The number of men's clothing factories in New York more than doubled during the decade of the 1880s. In addition, much clothing production was contracted out to be performed at home in the Lower East Side tenements, the sweatshops. The much-criticized sweatshops, with their low peace rates necessitating long hours of work, often by whole families, served a crucial function for the Jewish immigrants. It was work immediately available when they arrived, usually destitute, in the United States. Because the work was done in the home, and home was in a Yiddish-speaking neighborhood, there was no need to know English, American customs, or even how to get to work. Parents did not have to leave their children unattended to go to work and while the children themselves were often used in the work, they were not roaming the streets at random, getting into trouble. Moreover, not all the long hours of work and overcrowded living in poor surroundings were due solely to poverty. Even the well-known journalist reformer Jacob Rees acknowledged that much of the money earned by Jews in the Lower East Side tenements was saved. Many were saving to bring over their family members still left in Europe, Two-thirds of all Eastern European Jewish immigrants arriving during this era had their passage to America paid by family members. Some sweatshop workers were saving to start their own businesses someday, or to give their children a better chance in life in America than they themselves had ever had in Europe. These aspirations were often fulfilled. The rise of the Lower East Side Jews, and of their counterparts in Chicago and elsewhere, became one of the American sagas of success. After years of travail, with much suffering and even tragedies along the way, the Eastern European Jews began to rise occupationally, first in business, then professionally, and in a wide range of fields. The role of pushcart peddler, with which so many began as new immigrants, declined rapidly as they made their way into more promising occupations. Jewish children, though initially struggling with their schoolwork, like other children with a foreign language and culture, eventually became overrepresented among those who graduated from high school and went on to college. The free municipal colleges of New York were a special boon to a group like the Jews, with a long tradition of reverence for education, who had long lacked the means or the opportunity to pursue it to higher levels in Eastern Europe. In the most prestigious of these institutions, the College of the City of New York, known as the Poor Man's Harvard, eventually nearly three-quarters of the students were Jews. By the late 1930s, more than half the physicians in New York were Jewish, as were nearly two-thirds of the dentists and lawyers. The distinction between German Jews and Eastern European Jews is not made in these data. However, the fact that the latter predominate numerically among American Jewry assures that such results would be virtually impossible unless they had achieved prosperity. In retrospect, it may seem easy to ridicule the fears of the German-American Jews that the mass immigration of Eastern European Jews would be a calamity for American Jewry as a whole. However, anti-Semitism did in fact escalate as masses of visibly foreign Jews made a negative impression on the surrounding society, as they did in other countries. With the passing generations, as they ceased to be foreign, the fact that they were Jews proved to be insufficient to sustain the same level of anti-Semitism. By 1969, Jews averaged 80% higher family income than other Americans, 
Heads of Jewish families were also older, averaging 50 years of age as compared to 44 years of age for Chinese Americans and 36 years of age for Puerto Ricans. Not only greater age, which encompasses more job experience, but also education has contributed to the prosperity of American Jews, most of whom are no longer middlemen. As of 1990, most Jews over the age of 25 had at least completed college, with about half of these having gone on to graduate study. By contrast, only 12% of the corresponding age bracket in the general white population of the United States had completed college. Not surprisingly, nearly 40% of all employed Jews were working in the professions, and another 17% in managerial occupations. Australia Jews came to Australia among the first settlers in 1788, arriving as most people arrived in that era, as convicts from Britain. As late as 1841, convicts and ex-convicts constituted just over half of the total population of New South Wales. Most Jews of that period were likewise convicts or ex-convicts. Altogether, there were only about a thousand Jews in Australia in 1841, and not quite two thousand in 1851. However, Jewish immigration increased sharply during the mid-century gold rush. Unlike others who crowded into the gold fields, however, the Jews came not primarily as prospectors or miners, but more often to sell provisions and merchandise to those who were seeking gold. The Jewish population in Australia grew to well over 5,000 in 1861 and to nearly 14,000 by 1891. Many of the early Jewish settlers during the colonial era were retailers, ranging from peddlers working in the bush country to urban shopkeepers and an occasional wealthy merchant. As in the United States, some began as peddlers and went on to own their own stores or even chains of stores. Jews often became liquor dealers and tavern keepers as well, their own low rates of alcoholism giving them a competitive advantage over others who might succumb to their own wares. As of 1828, more than a third of Australian Jews were merchants and only one-fifth were laborers. By 1845, there were 25 clothing stores in Melbourne owned by Jews, compared to 21 owned by all others. As in many frontier societies, men outnumbered women among the Jews in colonial Australia. The sex imbalance and the wide dispersal of Jewish men among Gentiles led to some intermarriage and abandonment of Judaism, though not by most Jews. While it was hazardous for women to migrate alone to Australia without someone to protect them from unwanted male attentions during the voyage, increasing migrations of free families, as distinguished from convicts, to Australia brought the Jewish population closer to a male-female balance. By 1861, there were nearly two-thirds as many Jewish women as men in Australia though ratios varied considerably from region to region, being nearly equal in South Australia and nearly two-to-one male predominance in Victoria. With the passing decades, the imbalance became much less pronounced. The perpetuation of Jewish communities was thus made possible demographically, while their cultural and religious survival was made possible by the fact that even small and isolated groups of Jews attempted to keep their traditions and communities alive. As early as 1817, for example, there was a Jewish cemetery in Australia. The maintenance of Jewish communities was facilitated by the fact that in Australia, as in other countries, Jews were concentrated in urban centers. As early as 1833, more than two-thirds of the Jews in the colony of New South Wales lived in Sydney. Both the nature of Australian society and of the early Jews themselves facilitated their social acceptance, legal freedom, and economic opportunities. A frontier society with many ex-convicts, Australia was not a place of rigid social status, nor one that inquired too closely into people's backgrounds. As an offshoot of Britain, it inherited the legal traditions of a free society and tended to liberalize them even further so that Jews, for example, could be members of the colonial parliament before they could legally enter the parliament in London. Most of the early Jewish immigrants to Australia were from Britain and were culturally anglicized so that they readily fit in with the rest of the population. Thus began a pattern of Jewish cultural assimilation, religious distinctiveness, and widespread participation in Australian public life. There were many indicators of the integration of Jews into Australian society, 
For example, Jews often became members of Masonic lodges, achieved high offices in these lodges, and some set up Masonic lodges themselves. High intermarriage rates were a further indication of social acceptance. So was an even rarer phenomenon among Jews around the world, an overrepresentation in 19th century Australian political and public life. A Jew was appointed as one of the commissioners when the new colony of South Australia was founded in 1836. Over the years, seven Jews became Lord Mayors of Melbourne, and there were also Jewish Mayors of Adelaide, Warwick, and other communities. There were more than a dozen Jewish members of the Victoria State Parliament between 1860 and 1901. In New South Wales, Jews at various times held such state offices as Speaker of the House and Chief Justice. At a national level, the first Australian-born Governor-General was a Jew. This political success was seldom, if ever, a result of Jewish voting power, since Jews were never as much as 1% of the Australian population. While many Australian Jews in public life were also active in their religious congregations and in the Jewish community in general, the Jewish community itself tended to keep a low profile, to blend in culturally and socially. Nor was this all a matter of caution toward the outer world. The assimilation was often inward as well. Like the Jews of Western Europe, Australian Jews conceived of themselves as Englishmen of the Mosaic faith, a religious denomination, but not a nationality in the sense of a separate cultural-political entity. Moreover, Judaism itself tended to be less a fervent conviction than a social focus. Violations of the dietary laws were widespread, as was the practice of keeping Jewish-owned businesses open on the Sabbath. Those who attended synagogues were often inattentive or even talking and visiting during the services. Most Jewish children in 19th century Australia were educated in non-Jewish schools. With the passing decades of the 19th century, the internal composition of Australian Jewry began to change, and with it their religious and cultural patterns began to change as well. As late as the middle of the 19th century, British Jews constituted 90% of the Jewish population in Australia. However, the gold rush brought in so many Jews from continental Europe that Anglo-Jews were only half the Jewish population of the country by 1861, and a declining proportion thereafter. German and Austrian Jews were especially prominent in the new waves of Jewish immigrants, but Eastern European, Palestinian, and other Jews also settled in Australia. While German and Austrian Jews shared the modern or acculturated social patterns of the Anglo-Jews, the more traditional Jews from Eastern Europe did not blend in nearly as well, either with Australian society in general or with the existing Jewish community. Eastern European Jews, who began arriving in substantial numbers in the 1890s, during the era of pogroms in Europe, were not simply a religious denomination. They lived an entirely Jewish way of life, spoke Yiddish, wore beards, dressed in the clothes long common in Eastern Europe, and were used to very traditional religious services, not such things as English-language liturgy, mixed choirs, or clean-shaven rabbis dressed like English parsons. Australian Judaism was predominantly orthodox rather than reform, but its innovations have caused it to be analogized to conservative Judaism in the United States rather than to American Orthodox Judaism. Eastern European Jews began to establish their own separate congregations as early as 1878 in Sydney, where their synagogue featured a more traditional and more emotional service. As in other parts of the world, the arrival of Eastern European Jews, unmistakably foreigners, was followed by an increase of anti-Semitism, from which all Jews suffered. One symptom of the internal differences and frictions among the increasingly diverse Jewish population of Australia was that Zionism was almost totally rejected by the leadership of the Anglo-Jews while it was embraced by those from Eastern Europe. As in other countries, Complaints against the newcomers from Eastern Europe included charges that they were too loud, conspicuous, and did not use enough soap and water. As in other countries, attempts by westernized Australian Jews to get them to change were resented by the immigrants from Eastern Europe. These were not problems of immigrants as such, but specifically of Eastern European, usually Polish, Jews. German and Austrian Jews tended to assimilate more readily, not only into the Australian Jewish community, where they established some reform synagogues, 
but also into the wider Australian society, where they or their children sometimes converted to Christianity. The various national groups of Jews differed occupationally, as well as socially and religiously. Polish Jews tended to concentrate in and around Melbourne, while Perth was the most common destination of Palestinian Jews, and Sydney that of Austrian Jews. This pattern of people from particular places abroad settling in particular localities in Australia included not only Jews from specific provinces or cities abroad grouping in specific cities in Australia, but even clustering sometimes in particular neighborhoods. Yet Jews in Australia did not transplant ghettos, either on a national origin basis or as Jews in general. Greeks and Italians lived intermixed among Jews from various nations. Jews in Australia were apparently not as concentrated as in some American Jewish ghettos, though even in the latter they were sometimes outnumbered by non-Jews. Few Jews from any part of the world worked in agriculture or as unskilled laborers in Australia, but their occupational distributions varied considerably by country of origin. For the period from 1881 to 1920, 30% of Russian Jews worked in textiles, compared to only 6% among German Jews, and much less among the non-Jewish Australians. As the 20th century dawned, there were more than 15,000 Jews in Australia, and this total rose to more than 20,000 by 1921. Although the national origins of Jewish immigrants to Australia were more diverse than in the early colonial period, Fewer than half of the 6,000 Jewish immigrants to Australia between 1881 and the onset of the First World War in 1914 were from Eastern Europe. As in the period from 1830 to 1880, most who were not from Britain were from Germanic Europe, Germany or Austria, the latter narrowly defined to exclude Eastern European regions of the Habsburg Empire. However, when Jewish immigration resumed after World War I, most of the more than 1,000 immigrants who came to Australia during the 1920s came from Eastern Europe, and well over half of them settled in Melbourne. The religiously more strictly orthodox and culturally more traditional Jews who settled in Melbourne long continued to be contrasted with the more cosmopolitan and reserved Jews of Sydney. It was said that Sydney was a warm city with cold Jews, while Melbourne was a cold city with warm Jews. Despite a growing diversity within Australian Jewry, their most prominent leaders long continued to come from the so-called Anglo-Jews, whose culture by this time was distinctly Australian rather than English. From this group came the best-known Australian Jew and the country's most famous military leader, Sir John Monash. Educated in the public schools, like so many 19th century Jews, Monash went on to become an engineer and a military officer. As General Monash, he was Commander-in-Chief of Australia's troops in Europe during the First World War. An Australian national hero, he was knighted and given numerous decorations. When he died in 1931, a quarter of a million people attended his funeral, clearly a national tribute, for this was several times the total Jewish population in Australia. Monash University, near Melbourne, is named for him. The national origins of Jewish immigrants to Australia changed again in the decade of the 1930s. After the rise of the Nazis in Germany and Austria during that decade, most Jews came from these two countries. When immigration resumed after World War II, national origins shifted again. Eastern European Jews were once more a majority among Jewish immigrants to Australia. Numbers were growing while these changes were taking place. The Jewish population in Australia rose to more than 30,000 by 1947, a doubling of its size since the beginning of the century. It nearly doubled again by 1981. This huge population growth was due to immigration rather than natural increase. Jewish families in Australia have historically had fewer children than the national average. As early as 1948, most of the Jews living in Australia had been born outside Australia. And, as late as 1984, two-thirds of all adult Jews in Australia had once lived in Nazi-occupied Europe. In short, the post-war Jewish population of Australia was radically different in composition from what it had been a century earlier, or even a half-century earlier. The post-war generation was a different Jewry in a different Australia. The European immigrants, predominantly Eastern European, 
had wrested control of Jewish life from the older Anglo-Jewish assimilationist elite. Moreover, the Holocaust and the founding of Israel brought all Jews together and heightened a sense of identity and purpose. The large post-war immigration of other groups to Australia meant that Jews were no longer in danger of being a lone, conspicuous minority, but were now part of a larger ethnic mosaic in a society where multiculturalism was promoted. The post-war generation established many synagogues and Jewish schools. By the mid-1980s, three out of five Jewish children in Australia were receiving Jewish day school education. In Melbourne, it was four out of five. One day school with 2,500 students may have been the largest Jewish school in the diaspora. The resurgence of Jewish identity in Australia, the growing size of the Jewish population, and its concentration in a few urban centers have all contributed toward lower rates of intermarriage. As of 1971, the overwhelming majority of Jews in Australia were married to other Jews, much more so than 50 years earlier. This seemed to reflect choice rather than rejection by the larger society. Most Jews surveyed claimed to have experienced no anti-Semitism in Australia. Jewish social welfare agencies continued a long tradition of taking care of their own needy in Australia, as they did around the world. In addition, Jews have long been prominent contributors to charities serving Australian society as a whole. Almost the entire Jewish community in Australia contributed money to Jewish causes. By and large, the Jewish community in Australia was prosperous and educated. Among young people between the ages of 16 and 22, nearly three-quarters of the Jews were full-time students, compared to about 20% of their contemporaries in the general population. While only one-half of one percent of the Australian population in general worked in law or medicine, 15% of the Jewish population of British or Australian origin worked in these professions. More than two-thirds of all Australian Jews were either employers or self-employed, compared to 10% of the general population. Alcoholism, delinquency, and crime were virtually unknown among the Jewish population in Australia. There have been many evidences of Jewish acceptance in Australia. While post-war Jews were not as overrepresented among prominent public figures in Australia as in the earlier years of Anglo-Jewish predominance, an estimated 10% of all barristers in Sydney and Melbourne were Jewish. At least one or two Jews have usually been in the cabinet, and from 1977 to 1982, the Governor-General of Australia was a Jew. On lists of the 200 richest people in Australia during the 1980s, about one-fourth were Jewish. One of the few sources of criticism of Australian Jews has been its own well-educated younger generation, which has sometimes seen its elders as having a crudeness and coarseness and a nouveau riche pattern. Whatever the merits or demerits of such charges, the freedom to utter them publicly is another indication of the sense of security of Jews in Australia. Implications A number of social, economic, and cultural patterns have been characteristic of Jews in many very different societies, widely scattered around the world. The Jews of the Diaspora have been identified for centuries as people of commerce, whether at the level of the lowly peddler or in the rarefied atmosphere of the international banker. Like other middleman minorities, Jews have, over time, often converted business success into higher education and professional training for their offspring. An ancient religious tradition of reverence for learning has in many countries been translated into secular intellectualism. Over a period of 75 years, Jews have won 16% of all Nobel Prizes awarded in the entire world, including more than one-third of those awarded in economics. Though they are much less than 1% of the world's population, and no more than 3% of the population of any country except Israel. There are fewer Jews in the world than there are Kazakhs or Sri Lankans. Similarly disproportionate over-representation of Jewish achievements in universities, commerce, industry, and the professions has marked their history in societies as different as medieval Spain, the Soviet Union, Australia, Argentina, Poland, the United States, and many others. Such achievements have been only part of a larger social pattern found repeatedly among Jews around the world. For example, unusually low rates of alcoholism have been found in studies of Jews in Poland, Canada, Prussia, Australia, and the United States. 
widespread philanthropy has likewise been characteristic of Jews from Europe to South Africa and from the Western Hemisphere to Australia. Although Jewish incomes have almost invariably been above the national average of the countries in which they lived, Jewish politics have consistently been of the political left, whether moderate or radical. They have opposed apartheid in South Africa, Franco in Spain, and have advocated the welfare state in France, Germany, the United States, Australia, and Israel. The creation of the Soviet Union and of Eastern Bloc communist nations owed much to Jews, though these governments later became antagonistic to the Jews of Israel abroad and to Jews in their own countries. Only belatedly, and on a much smaller scale, have Jews become prominent among opponents of the political left. Raymond Aron in France, and Milton Friedman and the leaders of the neoconservative movement in the United States being notable examples. Within the working class, as well as among businessmen, intellectuals, and political figures, Jews have long had a distinctive pattern. Their artisan and technical skills have ranged widely, from shoemaking to diamond cutting, tailoring, and many other garment trade skills. Even where Jewish immigrants have arrived in many countries destitute, ill-educated, and lacking a knowledge of the national language, they have nevertheless brought with them the ingredients of future success for their children, if not for themselves. The history of Jews has not, of course, been merely a history of achievements, but also of suffering and catastrophe. The achievements and the anguish have not been unrelated. Like many other groups with strikingly higher achievements than those around them, Jews have been resented, hated, and made the targets of politicians and of mobs. Where the skills of the Jews have been especially rare in the surrounding population, in Eastern Europe or the Arab countries, for example, Jews have been especially hated. The nations most noted for tolerance of Jews, Britain, Scandinavia, Holland, the United States, and Australia, for example, have usually had no lack of skills and talents in their general populations. In short, it has often been precisely in those societies most desperately in need of the special skills of Jews that anti-Jewish hostility has flourished most. Antisemitism in Nazi Germany represented a very different phenomenon, the power of modern mass communications propaganda in a totalitarian state to produce fanatics who were neither representative of the history of the country nor able to sustain their influence after competing views were free to be heard. What made the Holocaust unique were the technical and organizational resources available to the Nazis, which made mass production methods applicable to the slaughter of human beings by a small fraction of the German population. Other historic mass murders were accomplished one by one by members of the general population, whether against the Jews in medieval Europe, the Chinese in Southeast Asia, the Hebos in Nigeria, or the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. The internal patterns of Jews have also varied greatly from place to place and from time to time. Where antisemitism was strongest and most implacable, Eastern Europe being again a prime example, Jews tended to be least assimilated in language or culture. Where acceptance was greater in Western Europe and their offshoot societies in North America or Australia, Jews tended much more to become culturally assimilated citizens and patriots. Nothing has so heightened or reawakened a sense of Jewish identity around the world as the Holocaust. For generations prior to World War II, culturally assimilated Jews in many countries drifted away from the Jewish religion, culture, and community, some intermarrying and their offspring often losing all sense of connection with the Jewish people. Among Marxists, there was a conscious rejection of such tribal links in favor of ideological ties with comrades in the political struggle. But the Nazi horror suddenly made all sorts of social, national, political, and other differences among Jews irrelevant. Centuries of internal differences between Sephardim and Ashkenazim, or between the secular and the religious, rich and poor, etc., did not vanish around the world, but were reduced to a smaller scale against the historic background of Auschwitz or Buchenwald. One of the fruits of this heightened cohesion among Jews of the world was the State of Israel.